a lot of people think he had 15,000 nanogram per deciliter serum levels of test, which no, this is, this this is, is a urine. urinary. <laughs> yeah. And it's like literally glucuronidated testosterone being urinated out. This isn't even yeah. like what's floating around in serum necessarily. So The Cheers. preface to this for the audience, we actually did a one hour deep dive into this autopsy report already. And we came to a conclusion that we actually realized in hindsight was um, we wanted to do a correction. So we never actually put it out because yeah. there was some interesting stuff with his electrolyte levels that at the time we thought we interpreted it correctly. It was my fault. And then, I, it was completely no, my it's, fault. It's not, not your fault. Like it's very easy. To no overlook. one would have even noticed yeah the thing you noticed first and then to actually go back and correct yourself by mm -hmm. digging into more obscure literature that no one would even think to look at too like it's yeah. a, i would not blame yourself at all for that so Derek, this is... you're just a very kind friend who always <laughs> like, you're one of the reasons i hate myself less that yeah. night i was i was in bed at 11 i like i think i was asleep already i had like yeah. a half nightmare like wait a minute what if and i got up and i found it out and i started texting derek but he was so nice <laughs> and i had a little bit of a hunch like during the recording but i wasn't exactly sure that potassium would spill into the bloodstream post-mortem because mm -hmm. I, I remember but you mentioned it out. and then we were like oh we don't know we don't yeah know. Well, i wasn't really was, sure he had the right hunch exactly and, and then you you started researching it and you contacted i was i think like middle middle of editing already <laughs> and he's like i'm sorry oh, we did something wrong and then i realized that okay our entire diagnosis is completely off um yeah. yeah but guys before we get started should we mention that we didn't just take this like everyone else did we had actually ordered this uh mm. or I, I had ordered the autopsy from florida because in florida they they uh, do autopsies on a lot of people and it's oftentimes public information i discovered this when i was doing my own ancestry my great grandpa died uh in uh, florida and i found out that from his autopsy that he had cirrhosis and that he was a, a heavy smoker and so on so i remembered that so i applied for it and this autopsy was actually only sent to four people one was a documentarian who has done a documentary on kai green and one was um the sun which is a newspaper i guess or something like that and the other one was tmz and the fourth one was me. They they showed all of our email addresses, so I realized that's how everyone else got this from TMZ. But we actually got it directly you from. Got a, he, he, they sent it to Mike Polsonella, right? No. No, the the guy that did the uh, Kai Green's documentary, or oh yeah, yeah, whoever that company is. But I didn't see yeah. his name. They oh, okay, the company. probably Mike Sorry, Polsonella. I didn't know that yeah. one. Mm. Oh, okay, that was him. Oh, yeah, I know. I, I think know so. That. Well, I, I, I would assume that that's the guy. Yeah, you have Dave Polsonella and Mike Polsonella, yeah. and uh, they, they did very good bodybuilding documentaries back in the day called Raising the Bar. If you can find exactly. them somewhere online, give them a watch. They're True. very, he, he very interesting. I, I learned a lot from those documentaries when I was really? coaching. Yeah, dude, really? like little tricks, like using a um, man, a hair a blow dryer for the hair. Just to increase vascularity, I would use this for the Thai bodybuilders when we travel international. Just put like five blow dryers upside down, blowing hot air into the, because we, all right, it's all drug tested. So we were limited in what we could use and it would get mad vascular and stay a little bit hot. And then they would go on stage. Yeah. Silly stuff, but it works. Wow. All right. Let's go over the, the, the document. So mm -hmm. the cause of death, they say sudden cardiac dysrhythmia due to hypertensive cardiovascular disease. And the contributing factors was anabolic steroid use, boldenone and stenazolol, which is a wind stroll for the people who don't know. Nick Strength and Power said he didn't know what boldenone and stenazolol was. So That's boldenone, EQ, equipoise, stenazolol, wind stroll. Yeah. yeah. How long? Do you guys remember how long stenazolol's half life is? It should be quite short, right? Um, yeah. If it's oral, it's well, detection yeah, it time is three weeks, and injectable is six to ten weeks. And boldenone it is stays, very long, right? Yeah, five months. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And these are detection limits of like literally present. So it's like it could be lingering. Like the EQ could have been from fucking like eight weeks ago for all we know. Like we yeah, don't or know five, if he was or on five, it. five months ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's, like undesilinate half life. I don't remember, like 15 days or something ridiculous. And then the actual detection time of it, like five half lives later, plus whatever residual metabolites linger. Mm -hmm at threshold concentrations in the urine that are like fucking minuscule because it's a synthetic compound that would otherwise not be there endogenously 
could it's not necessarily indicative that he was going into the show on a high dose of EQ, but and then, just worth mentioning. Would Winstrol, the reason why there's a discrepancy between the detection time between oral and injectable is because the injection depot actually keeps the Winstrol crystals in place for way longer than passing them through the liver. So you see that injectable Winstrol might have a six to 10 week detection time, depending on a multitude of factors over okay. three weeks of oral. So just keep that in mind. And um, also preface that Peterson was two days out from the Olympia when this happened yeah. or one. Yeah. So yeah. right before the show. So, right. you know, obviously speculation around diuretic use, potentially um, report did not mention anything about diuretics though. Yeah. Um, just mention anabolic steroid. It was kind of like a urine panel for as if a athlete being tested for doping. Cause that's just presumably the cost effective way they analyze urine for anabolic androgenic steroid metabolites. So anyways. Yeah. So here they said, in conclusion, uh, considering the circumstances of this, his death and the toxicology analysis, they think that the death of George Peterson was caused by a sudden cardiac dysrhythmia due to a hypertensive cardiovascular disease and a contributing factor is anabolic steroid use. So the main reason why they analyzed that is because of his um, present heart enlargement. Leo, I'm sure you want to go on yeah, a little we... bit of explanation there. Sure. So I... uh, about the heart enlargement while you, oh, you found it all there. there yeah, 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 so his, it. Heart, yeah. his heart was 500 grams. The normal range is about 250 to 300 grams. Uh, 400 is usually a cut off for um, labeling someone having cardiomegaly, which just means you have an enlarged heart. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have a pathologically en enlarged heart. A pathologically enlarged heart could be enlarged due to hypertension. And as it gets enlarged, it loses some of its um, um, like it becomes pathological in its function, loses some of its func uh, functional integrity. Like we'll talk about later with a thickened uh, ventricle wall, which can, which Steve will, uh, I'm sure, comment on. But yeah. so anyway, what I was trying to say is we don't know that it's a, it's not clear here because they haven't measured the the certain the, the best uh, indicators of having a pathologically uh, cardiomegaly kind of with myopathy is uh the size is not measured here so all we know here is actually that it's slightly large and the left ventricle is thickened and so on so it could be an athletic heart but just before i finish i wanted to mention that so it's beyond the cutoff it's 500 grams it's double the size of some other people's hearts but uh, if we remember that rich piana's heart uh was around 800 grams if i recall correctly no i think rich rich piano was 600 something and then dallas mccarver was 830. Uh, uh, are you Grand? sure it wasn't that Dallas was a thousand? No, no, it was. No, the, it was eight hundred. The highest okay. instances recorded was a thousand uh, grams. Okay. But I think we covered uh, it last time. I just didn't yeah. have the notes here. Yeah. No, that's okay. So I think okay. a rich piano was approximately six hundred grams, and then Dallas McCarver was eight hundred thirty grams or something of the sorts, which is severely disproportionate, yeah. right? Because we we can assume that heart enlarges slightly according to body weight. So a larger individual would have a larger heart compared to a smaller individual. So when you compare uh, the weight of George Peterson to the weight of Rich Biana, they're both enlarged, but maybe proportionally enlarged to their body weight. Whereas with mm -hmm. Dallas McCarver, his heart was severely disproportionately um, right, enlarged compared to his body weight. Mm -hmm. so, still, it's, it's way over the heart. Yeah that about the weight of acromegalix and their organ weights and for dallas in particular too it's not just they like obviously the guy was very very heavy and huge and body weight has a huge contributing you know blood pressure body weight all these things are contributing factors the amount of anabolic androgenic steroids you're using but also the growth hormone dose and i think yeah. with dallas in particular his growth hormone abuse i think far exceeded what rich piano was likely doing far exceeded what a lot of these guys who have autopsy reports are doing and i think that was a big contributor as well to his significantly heightened uh organ weights because yeah. um i've never seen somebody have such a blatant representation of um like essentially like flagship acromegaly development throughout his professional career going from winning his pro card to when he passed like the changes, morphological changes in cranial structure, just absolutely like so blatant and insane how quickly they happen too. If that's happening at like the actual 
like cosmetic level. You can just imagine what's happening at the organ, like morphological level as well. So I think that was a big contributing factor for Dallas and probably somewhat representative of the disparity and like Rich Piana, also a 300 pound guy who probably didn't use as much anabolics as Dallas because he wasn't like actively competing, but probably mm-hmm. uses fair bit of shit, um, was known for stimulant use, but I doubt he was using the copious amounts of pharma GH that Dallas was using. And I'm sure Peterson being a guy in classic physique, or I think he was 212 too. Yeah. He has weight limits that he has to stay within. Like his his dosage burden of everything was probably like far more reasonable. Body weight was lower significantly. So a lot of this I think is representative in the organ weight disparity we see on yeah. these autopsy reports. Wait, Wait just uh, a sub note about Rich, uh, just because I live in California. I'm, I'm close friends with one of Rich's 20 year old friends. And uh, the the rumor was in LA, at least from from my close friend, from he says Rick Rich's mouth, uh, was that he was using thirty units a full a full uh, thing in those days. Especially there was um, a lot of AIDS patients in California getting uh, GH treatment, and uh, my friend who was uh, Rich's close friend for twenty years, he was taking thirty a day also, and he said Rich was as well. So I don't know if he was oh. toward the end also. And I just wanted to mention the average acromegalic size is actually specifically 600. I had checked out a study. Okay. 600 okay. grams, yeah. Okay. okay. But yeah, sorry to interrupt, guys. So when we look at the rest of his cardiovascular system, right, there's moderate amounts of epicardial fat. So that's the fat uh, surrounding the heart, providing a little bit of energy uh, in cases of need. And the coronary arteries are normal, no arteriosclerosis or stenosis or something like that. Um, Otherwise, besides the heart enlargement on the left ventricular side, the heart appears to be healthy. So again, there's no arteriosclerosis, no uh, cardiovascular disease. Yeah. It just means that the left ventricular uh, hypertrophy is present and the, the walls are two centimeters thick, which is quite steep. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's quite a thick um, enlargement and thickening of the heart. And um, I think that's where the diagnosis of um, hypertension comes from. Because again, right, hypertension, you can't uh, diagnose post-mortem. Um, but that's probably the speculation why they say that hypertension is one of the uh, contributing causes of death. Now, we, which we is don't... Weird, which is weird though, Steve, right? Because if you think about it, like what I was mentioning earlier, the key indicator of whether it's pathologically large heart is the, the cavity size, which she didn't measure. Mm. So you would think that if she, if if the um, mortician had said, or I don't know what the job is, but if they had said that it, it was hypertension induced as opposed to athletic, you would mm. think that they could clarify that it was pathologic. But we have no actual evidence that it's pathologically large. Uh, like even mm. even when she recorded, she wrote uh, hypertrophic cardiac myocytes with enlarged nuclei. She didn't say hyperplasia in the nuclei, or she didn't, and she didn't measure that part. So I just wanted to say, like it's a. Uh, seems like a slight leap because if you're a weightlifter mm. and and you're and you're strong you get acute hypertension when you're weightlifting that's how you get an athletically enlarged heart right and it just you know? just comes with the territory so he doesn't have a astronomically enlarged heart and i would say it's representative of what you can expect from a bodybuilder at his level and and taking uh, the performance enhancing drugs that were um uh, you know through the toxicology report Mm. So, yeah, I mean, his heart looks otherwise healthy, besides the hypertrophy, mm. and and all of his veins and 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 arteries are clean as well. There's no issue diagnosed there. Hey, let's point out a guy who's 37 years old. I think he's 37 years old, uh, and African Americans are a little bit more predisposed to heart disease, both genetically and this is shown in research evidence, both genetically and due to environmental and, of course, you know, socioeconomic reasons. But mm-hmm. the fact that he didn't have a uh, plaque clearly in the coronary arteries and didn't have calcification is quite impressive at yeah. 37. There are many people like we were just in bodybuilding. A lot of people have been doing their, their CT scans for their coronary arteries to see if they have calcium buildup. If you're 37 and you have anything on that score, you have calcium and you've had plaque for over 10 years, usually on average. And some of these bodybuilders, not to mention any names, but they've been, they've been saying so openly, have in the hundreds their yeah. CAC scores. Mm-hmm. So that's so he didn't have that. So imagine, no. you know, interesting. I mean, based on based on the the analysis of his organs, he looks reasonably healthy. Except and, and, except and, remember the the, yeah, the, the liver is were, the liver is a little bit enlarged and and the kidneys yeah. are a little bit enlarged. His lungs are normal size. 
I didn't know no issues there, but like the liver here was 2,300 grams, which is larger than normal, but you can also kind of expect that with the food quality yeah. and the drugs involved and, and right, just the additional stress that you put on your body by the act of bodybuilding. I think this is to be expected at this level. And again, there, there's no, um, no polyps, no cysts, no issues with the bowel duct, um, no stenosis or what is it called? Fibrosis, sorry. Mm. Um, so again, besides that it's enlarged, the liver looks otherwise healthy and it's, it's the same for yeah. the kidneys. Let me, let me see where. That's a really good point. Like she would have clearly, if it was very fatty, the liver, or yeah, if it did have, have any that. kind of like scar scarring there, she wouldn't see the inflammation, but if it had some kind of what, what the scarring in the liver is called cirrhosis. Yeah, cirrhosis. So if, he, if he did have that, I, I bet you a lot of bodybuilders. I mean, I actually, I get messages from people all the time that have liver tumors, bodybuilders that they, they, in fact, I had one guy on the channel. I don't know if you ever guys, guys ever saw that podcast of the guy who I came saw on the channel yeah. with liver cancer. Remember how he found out he had the liver cancer he was walking on the street and he mm. bumped into something oh, and right. it hit his yeah it hit his midsection it hurt so much he went to the hospital found out he had a tumor that had just burst wow yeah, yeah. Wow. so yeah so and a friend a of mine of had that had that also like a cyst in his liver and it exploded and it's creatinine was six and his liver enzymes were a thousand and the cpk was twenty thousand to just flood the system with all these toxins and metabolic waste products no, he was in the hospital for a week. They had to cut had to cut part of his liver out. That's how yeah, poorly that, his liver health was, you know. That's a good point. You can you can have cysts also, but you can also have the adenomas, the the you can have you can have you can have adenomas and then you can have uh tumors that are growing that are cancerous or not. So there's a, yeah, yeah, a ben, benign happened. benign uh, adenoma. Yeah. I can't remember yeah, what exactly. it's called. It's completely benign in some cases it's from childbirth already. So if you see yeah. a little dot, a little circle in the liver, it doesn't mean it's a cyst. It could just be there like a, a coagulation of blood vessels that can mm. burst also if you put a lot of strain on it. So he, my friend of, friend of mine, he was squatting four plates and then it burst. But of course he was on oral steroids. So his blood pressure was high and I'm sure it was a contributing factor also. He lived I mean, by the way, guys. So <laughs> don't worry. And maybe we should mention just if the audience is curious, if they're using PEDs, the reason why the liver would be particularly interesting is because if you're using GH or BPC or TB500 or uh, mm. EPO, anything that uh, causes blood vessel development in the liver, the thing that predisposes you the most to liver cancer, I believe, is, is that vascular development. The liver cancers really respond to that. Yeah. So the kidneys were both slightly enlarged, uh, approximately 200 grams each. But again, uh, normal echocinicity and, and um, normal appearance. So uh, besides the uh, the enlargement, no real indication that his kidneys were damaged um, or anything of the sort. Yeah, we should mention that that Dallas's were exactly double. The combined weight of his kidneys were almost exactly double, 800, around 800 yeah. grams. Yeah. yeah, crazy. Yeah, so most of his organs are actually in expectable condition right and, and most notable that there's no uh, real cardiovascular disease or or a plaque buildup in the coronary artery um so that is of note and then when we you get what, to the one thing sorry i forgot to mention earlier we mm -hmm. don't really know the average heart size of african americans as compared to the average population most of the average heart size studies as both me and steve found out were done on either mixed populations that were the majority uh, European descent or some Asian actually studies. But like, for example, I, I discovered, I was trying to figure out whether heart size differed between ethnicities. I found out that average heart size among Pacific Islanders is larger specifically. And Pacific Islanders, as we found out on a recent video I made, that they have a myostatin uh, deficiency like in Samoans that makes them so large. Uh, uh, polymorphism found in about 20 to 40 percent of them if i recall correctly so african-americans have differences in their igf1 signaling as well and as we can see from their physicality sometimes they have larger muscles or you know so there could be it might not be as enlarged as we realize is what i'm saying no and i mean how much is it disproportionately large to the bodybuilding community i think it's very representative of most bodybuilders competing at that high level like most bodybuilders have some sort of an enlarged heart some are more enlarged than others, obviously, depending on how hard they train, how much hypertension is present and how much drugs they're taking. Mm. But uh, to say I died due to heart enlargement, well, that's basically the entire fitness community, mm. you know? So 
right? I have borderline enlarged heart, uh, but that was diagnosed when I was off cycle and um, right months off after being off cycle. So if I were to do an MRI again, I'm sure my heart would be larger now after being on cycle for a couple months compared yeah. to back then when I was off cycle for a couple months, right? It will hypertrophy and grow with the strenuous workouts and the drugs that I'm taking. So not to mention when you're taking GH, like um, acromegalic people, the pathology of how their organs grow is first the organ has like an edema. It holds more mm. in, um, extracellular water. And in fact, that's the major difference between acromegalic people and people with high GH is they have extracellular water differences. So uh, so the heart would enlarge when you're on GH as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think that the, the additional water retention puts a lot of strain on your heart. You're basically creating myocarditis, right? Mm -hmm. Inflammation around the heart, but it's coming from water retention and it might impair its function also, right? Making mm -hmm. it, forcing it to work harder than necessary. Of course, that's where the what sodium glucose transporter type 2 comes into place. Um, so that's, that's something of note. Let's see, toxicology here. Um, no drugs in the system. So something to note that a lot of people misinterpret about this is they don't know the difference between what's testing in blood versus urine. So right here, it specifically says blood drug screen through immunoassay. So these are recreational drugs like amphetamines, mm -hmm. fentanyl, cocaine, et cetera. But later when we get to the synthetic anabolic androgenic steroid portion of this tox, tox report, these it's going to be urine metabolites, not yeah. blood. So when we're talking about his testosterone levels, this is not something you convert from nanograms per milliliter to nanogram per deciliter and figure out, oh, he was on 10 grams of test. Like, no, this is not what we're reading here. So, mm -hmm. so first of all, clenbuterol was tested for, right, as well, and it's a none detected. So some interesting no, compounds no that you would think would be in a system at two days out of the biggest show of the year, not there. Masteron, not there. Trenblow, not there. Mm -hmm. um clen not there halo tested not, not there. there um primo also not there we had speculated that maybe the boldenone might have been like faked and he thought yeah. he had primo but i don't know like we'd be just speculating if he had fake drugs or not because some people would think why would you go into the show not on trend or whatever mm -hmm. we had i don't know like ultimately the guy is the top of his weight class as far as i know i could be wrong on that but i I don't know anyway. if he needs these other things. Like some of these cosmetic agents, I would think would have been no brainers like Halo maybe or Masteron that won't necessarily inflate his body weight significantly. But I mean, well, you got to remember that, you know, he was a seasoned competitor. And yeah. as you develop more muscle maturity and really dial in your physique, I mean, he was always in shape, probably the best and most conditioned guy of the show in any class. Right? He was really yeah. in, the, in the top three of most conditioned guys. And in that case, you don't need so much anymore. So whereas he might have needed halo tests in, in the beginning of his career to create artificial fullness and hardness, once you've really developed that muscle maturity and you have a weight cap, you can't really play with too much drugs anymore because right, taking the halo and the super draw and the this and the that will just prevent you from making weight. Now, he was 205 pounds at the moment of uh, this um, autopsy report, but he could have been... a, a 211.9 pounds of the day before right at the weigh-in or did he weigh in or no i'm not really sure if you weighed in so he, I, I believe that we figured out that you do lose weight after uh dying right whether that's urine or um, through defecation or right drying out slightly so you he might have been on the cusp of the weight limit and if you're on the cusp mm -hmm. you can't use all of the drugs because they just put weight on you and you have to be in shape and make weight. And I've noticed this many times myself with guys competing in weight classes. With all that muscle maturity, you can't use strength and you can't use halo because it, it, it just prevents you from making weight. And then you need to do drastic measures and take a fuck ton of diuretics um, and, and not eat for like two or three days to uh, get the weight off. Hmm. Um, so right. I think that's why his drug selection is just test bolded on a windstraw, assuming it's all real. Yeah um yeah so we can confirm based on this again this is urine this would be done cool. via a more or less a athletic anti-doping panel so mm -hmm. this is not like oh this is a bodybuilder we should test them for anabolic so there's, there's a reason there's random shit on here he yeah, would probably like be using room. like yeah cross the ball like obviously an olympia competitor is not necessarily 
you know, the foundation of his cycle isn't Blastron. So no. this is like an old school panel. And this is where we see the representation of his testosterone levels. And we can sort of extrapolate out from there, potentially what he might've been on dosage wise for that. But for Boldenone, we don't know how long was in the system, what was in the system at the time, how many weeks ago he dropped it, or if he was still on it. Stenozolol, I think it's safe to say he was at least going into the show. The plan was test and Stenozolol were the base mm -hmm. compounds. And then maybe residual EQ. But if we could go down to the test levels, this is where some of the discrepancy comes in interpretation. So we see yeah. his testosterone um, levels, the reporting limit is nanograms per milliliter versus epi testosterone none detected. So this is your endogenous steroidogenesis is shut down when you're on exogenous hormones. Everyone knows that. So this is why upstream in the steroidogenesis cascade, epi testosterone is a precursor it's up higher than you know you have like dhea androstenedione, dion all these things and down at the bottom you have testosterone dht and all these metabolite estrogens and whatnot upper closer to the top you have epi testosterone it's not a byproduct of test so your epi t actually goes down when you take exogenous testosterone further inflating this testosterone to epi testosterone ratio and this is why guys who are caught doping testosterone to epi testosterone is usually in a ratio of one to one in a natural and then at most accounting for genetic outliers due to UGT to B17, UGT to B17 polymorphisms that impact your ability to glucuronidate testosterone and excrete it or urinate it out essentially. Um, it's going to potentially, you might see a natural at four to one might be like the most dramatic outlier possible, but 99.9% .9 of people are not going to fall outside that range naturally. So if you have a T to E ratio of less than four, it's considered normal, while a ratio greater than or equal to four is considered an abnormal finding, suggestive of testosterone use or abuse. And see, the ratio is recommended by WADA. So this is like 100% anti-doping panel. So he had no EPT detected, so he shut down, as we know, and then he has 150 nanogram per milliliter test levels. So we do not convert that to nanogram per deciliter and say, look, he was on like fucking 10 grams of test. That's not what we do. Yeah. We look yeah, did at Did someone one... do that, by the way? Yeah. yeah somebody... we don't see who. So <laughs> a, a lot of people who were interpreting this, they were critiquing each other's interpretations of it too and correcting each other and saying, you know, stuff like oh, that. Really? I don't, I don't <laughs> want to say names specifically, but there was yeah. people converting this amount to nanogram per deciliter and being like, look, this, like, well, let me even look up what that is. Nanogram per milliliter to nanogram per deciliter. So we're looking 15, at 15,000. So, so a lot of people think he had 15,000 nanogram per deciliter serum levels of test, which no, this is, this this is, is a urine. urinary. <laughs> yeah. And it's like literally glucuronidated testosterone being urinated out. This isn't even yeah. like what's floating around in serum necessarily. So so again, this ratio of 150 to zero, if we have a four, a one to one ratio in a natural and a four to one in genetic outliers, like 150 to zero, like he was obviously, I would speculate on grams of androgens in totality. Mm. I don't know, but like how many grams it was at least, I would imagine at least over a gram of test, but I wouldn't go so far as to say, oh, he had a clearly on like five grams of test or something because no. i've seen some of the ufc ratios of guys who popped at like i think like uh fran uh who was it um alistair overeem uh chael sonnen some of these guys have popped for high t to e ratios before and i've seen kind of representations in the literature of genetic outliers when it comes to urinary metabolite ratios and whatnot and how many milligrams of test guys can get away with with and without genetic um polymorphisms and whatnot and um i would speculate like this is over a gram of test but i don't know how much higher it is but based on the ratios i've seen this is like he's on grams of something in general you know mm. so i would imagine at least a gram a gram and a half of tests with a good amount of winstrol and some undisclosed amount of boldenone that may or may not have been in the system intentionally at the time of going into the show and yeah, that's I mean kind of the the furthest I could really speculate as far as like what he was taking. I think and at his level, you can just run bold and on all the way to the show. And I don't think that needs to be discontinued. There's no, no 
calls for I agree. more attention. I just don't think a lot of people at that level, the gurus they use, yeah, I don't they, think they know that. Know, I think they yeah. think EQ is going to bloat you because yeah. it converts at half the rate of test to estrogen, <laughs> which we know is not the case at all. <laughs> I've never but seen... That's, I've never seen a uh, top coach's cycle that was pre-contest that had EQ personally in it. I've never seen. Okay, it. Can good. I, can I've, I've ask seen you it. Derek yeah. about that. I've seen it. That, but, yeah. Derek, can I ask you? Do they? Does anyone try to inject epi testosterone to trick the? Test? Yeah, but there's a urinary cutoff. So see, the reporting okay. limit is two nanograms per milliliter. So if you had, let's just say, a test to epi test ratio of okay. one to one, but your reporting limit, you exceed that, they're going to okay. go see. Oh, you clearly use exogenous epi testosterone. But back in the maybe like a couple a few decades ago that was a very very commonly abused way to get around the system oh wow but now they use maybe not a few decades but like you know before they came out with more sophisticated longitudinal data with the biological passport and threshold limits Okay. But I think they also use carbon uh what radiocarbon isotope and carbon isotope ratio yeah. testing to yeah. to see if the testosterone or epi testosterone is synthetic compared to bioidentical yeah yeah, which you can skirt around by using animal-derived cholesterol and reacting it down. But at the end yeah. of the day, even if you exceed the four-to-one cutoff of testosterone to epitestosterone, they have to do confirmatory testing via carbon isotope ratio. You can't actually say for certain somebody's doping unless you have a direct identifying characteristic in like the chemical signature of it that it's deriving from plant-derived sources because that's what commercial-grade tests is synthesized from mm -hmm. so if it looks like it's being made in your body through endogenous processes because it's animal derived it's like you can't really prove anything you can have the guy on your radar and like red flag him and keep like a very fucking close eye on him but you can't really prove anything if he has like a six to one ratio but his his test passes the carbon isotope ratio test like what are you gonna do you know you can't prove shit yeah. so look, look for something else <laughs> Yeah, like exactly. Something else to flag the guy. So, right, based on his toxicology report, uh, not the most exciting cycle, but it is of note that aromatized inhibitors and diuretics were not tested. So, we don't know if he used letrozole, arimidex, um, right, Lasix, other loop diuretics, uh, hydrochlorothiazide or diazide, aldactone. That has not been determined. Now, I want to scroll up a little bit because the last time we made a little bit of a mistake on uh, reading the potassium. Oh, let me, where is it? So the potassium was um, basically uh, death inducing high, 13.6 milli equivalent per liter, which in reality should be what, four to five at maximum, 4.5 4 at maximum, yeah. Leo. And then, so last time we thought this was the root cause of death, where the potassium was so high that he would go into a cardiac event, right? Potassium but it's for everybody to know is the active ingredient of a lethal injection. That's how a lethal injection works. Super high serum potassium levels causing your heart to stop. But we later figured out or we speculated and then later confirmed that um, after death, potassium leaks from the surrounding tissue into the bloodstream and then causes potassium levels to be very, very high. Not um, only that, but the specific level he had, 13.6, is actually the average level if mm -hmm. they tested his blood after death about within the three to six hour range. So yeah. it, it's like perfectly normal. And not only that, but the sodium, which is a tiny bit... Uh, uh tiny lower. bit uh low on the low end it's it's uh that also gets lower after they die so like there's almost nothing we can really make of of the of the mineral part no unfortunately so if 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 his blood work looked like this at the time he was alive it would surely induce a heart attack yeah right so whether that's due to potassium loading or diuretic use potassium sparing diuretics in combination with potassium loading that it would have surely killed him but Right, based on this autopsy report, I mean, this amount of potassium is normal. Glucose being low is apparently normal also. Um, blood urine nitrogen, I'm not really sure if that's after death that it changes. Um, it's very, very high. Right? You see bodybuilders with 30, 32 milligrams per deciliter because um, high protein intake. Protein, yeah. Yeah, but I'm not really sure if that after death is that increases. Um, his creatinine is uh, beautifully low, though. So I, I would assume that his kidneys were functioning properly. Yeah. It's uh, he so seemed, I mean, on paper, he's basically, you he could almost think he's just yeah. athletic. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah, I would say yeah. that is basically healthy, uh, besides a little bit of enlargement, which is to expect at this level of competition and in combination with drug use. Um, so it's very hard to pinpoint the cause of death. I, I, so basically, we think that sh that the coroner or mortician or whatever they're called exactly, that they assumed that uh, he had hypertension because he had an enlarged heart. But in reality, he's a weightlifter and he would get uh, acute hypertension anyway from that and his heart would grow over time. So we don't really understand, I guess, in my opinion, I don't really understand how she diagnosed the, uh, the, the, the dysrhythmia. I mean, obviously, there must be dysrhythmia for, for some kind of heart attack to happen, but... Yeah. How they diagnose that, I don't know. And then the hypertension also, I don't know how they diagnose that either. Yeah, it's pretty but it could weird. be I, I, because of the left ventricular hypertrophy and the thickening of the walls. I mean, that, that could be the underlying uh, root cause of this diagnosis. And of course, the contributing factors of anabolic steroid use. I mean, but, you know, people get heart attacks and die without steroid use. Um, I'm sure there, there might be a contributing factor in the left ventricular hypertrophy just as training insane is a contributing factor or growth hormone use is a contributing factor. Um, but it, it, yeah, I, I think it may be a genetic oh, defect maybe. because I do, do understand that, that George Peterson's father died of a heart attack at a similar age. We should mention if it was due to growth hormone, how do people who have acromegaly usually die? Like bodybuilders, they usually die in their early 40s or late 30s of uh, heart failure or a sudden mm -hmm. cardiac event. But, you know, that anyway, so we can, I can't really make out much out of it myself. I mean, uh, I think there I think that the autopsy, I think that maybe it was not comprehensive enough. There should have been something else, you know, mm hmm. I think it's a freak accident. I mean, maybe at the time of that he passed, he was weak, obviously, uh, coming into the show. Maybe diuretics were used, but I, I believe that his coach ensured everybody that diuretics uh, were not used at the time. And uh, yeah, he, he told Boston that the day he died, actually, the day that George died, uh, mm -hmm. his coach uh, called Boston or texted Boston, and oh, he was he was horrified because of course the, the coach uh, seems to be a nice guy, and he was close yeah. to George. And he was very concerned and he told Boston he didn't even use diuretics, you know. Yeah, so uh, it probably could have been a freak accident. And it's very unfortunate because George Peterson had a great physique. I mean, he was always in shape and a very likable guy, like no drama out of his camp. Always very passionate about what he was doing. Um, I was following him actively. And then you get the news, and you're like, man, you know, one, another one of the good guys that passed. It's like John Meadows, you know, and unfortunately, yeah. both of them from a heart attack. And apparently both of them had um, hereditary issues with uh, heart disease in his family or in their family. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what, what can we learn from this? Um, if you have hereditary issues in your family, um, don't bodybuild. I mean, if, if you have a family member who di who got cancer before 40 and you're close family, or mm -hmm. if you have a fa family member, like I'm saying uncles, aunts, or di or parents, or direct grandparents, if some of them died before 50 of a heart attack, you should look into it, I think. Yeah. That's what mm -hmm. I would do personally. I agree. Yeah. Like, for example, I had, uh, I don't actually have this gene or these whatever set of polymorphisms caused this, but I have in my family, I didn't know this myself. I had heard when I was younger, my mother told me, my American mother told me that her uh, grandmother from her paternal side had died suddenly of a heart attack and that they had, they, we had that on our side of the family. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know much about it. When I finally like did all uh, my family tree and stuff like that, I was surprised to find out that, so basically my mom's grandmother died of a sudden heart attack in her forties, mm -hmm. both of her parents, died of a sudden heart attack in their 40s and then my mom's uncle also recently died also in his 50s of a sudden heart attack so there's sometimes things like that you might find you guys have uh lipoprotein little a polymorphism you might have a apoe4 homozygous variant like i know uh you know some bodybuilders who are who are people that are known on youtube who have the apoe4 variant and I've warned them. I'd be like, "Are you are you taking drugs to protect your heart in any kind of way? Do you really want to do bodybuilding? Do you really want to continue this?" And this complete. I've never had one guy say, "Oh, this is scary." For some reason, no. they're like, "No, I don't the, the, care." And the problem is, like, like, we can take George Peter for Peterson for as an example. Let's say you would do a CT scan or an MRI. 
They would say his heart is enlarged, but he has yeah. no coronary artery issues. I right? no issues with the, with the blood vessels. Maybe an EKG or an ECG would determine some sort of a conductivity issue, which can occur when your heart is larger and the, the nerves around the heart, they don't fire uniformly, causing you to go into an arrhythmia. I think I mentioned that previously mm. on the previous recording. So let's say maybe this happened to him due to heart enlargement, maybe a contributing factor is high potassium, which we speculated last time, but could be incorrect. The conductivity around this heart, heart caused an arrhythmia, causing it to contract irregularly, sending him into an arrhythmia, causing his heart attack, which is a, a known effect of having um, left ventricular hypertrophy, especially if it's mm -hmm. severe, right? because again, the nerves and the signal doesn't uh, arrive at the heart uniformly. Um, but if you if you were to do an MRI or CT scan and you would look at your heart and oh, I got left ventricular hypertrophy, moderate enlargement, I'm okay. All my other organs are okay. So you kind of put your head in the sand. I'm not saying that George Peterson would have done that. Uh, we don't know if he did all this organ imaging. But mm -hmm. uh, based on talking to a lot of bodybuilders in my years, they really they only stop if there's a severe medical condition. Most yeah, of them, they that don't do yeah. preventative stuff, right? As we can take myself as an example. I did a screening of my organs and I got non-alcoholic fatty liver disease diagnosed and I, I stopped. I fixed it first. But how many bodybuilders would actually fix it? No, not many because right, many bodybuilders have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. So it's, it's very unfortunate, but it's very hard to pinpoint what the actual root cause is besides the arrhythmia that took place and what really caused the arrhythmia is well, we could say that it's a, the, the left ventricular hypertrophy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. Good point. So basically so, all we know is it's a that bit more ambiguous than there's no like clear cut answer really, but we see some morphological changes of the organs. We know we had a historical use of anabolic androgenic steroids prepping for a lot of shows. Maybe had genetic predispositions, mm -hmm. um, potassium thing. We can't really prove anything because it may have mm -hmm. leaked post after post dying. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, that's that's kind of all you can gather for it. And you just speculate. It's kind of fucked up how, you know, it's just, it almost, I don't know, like there's no evidence of use of diuretics versus not in this talks mm -hmm. report. So we can't say for certain, but I think his coach, you know, you mentioned how the coach said he didn't use diuretics. Yeah. whether you take that at face value or not i don't know uh, so. a thing of note a thing of note what i do know is because i've tested diuretics extensively right figuring out clearance of electrolytes and how it affects your blood work uh, with athletes in the past i will say that when you look at his electrolyte yes his potassium is a bit high but his creatinine what? is quite low which with diuretics if you use diuretics um potassium can go down or a creatine can go down but then shoots up afterwards after a little bit of burden has taken mm -hmm. place on the kidneys and aldosterone concentrations change so mm -hmm. that's just something of note right can i prove it Pro uh, no no just anecdotal evidence that i've seen over the years or cre mm -hmm. creatinine goes down and then goes up depending on uh, the time where you're tested in relation to the diuretic yeah that's, that's we can know one thing for sure he he didn't have he was not uh is it called hyponatremic? He didn't have very low sodium when he died because no. I've seen the, I, you know, and potassium is actually so reliably, um, it changes so reliably. So after you die yeah. that, um, that academics actually use potassium levels, for example, in the eye to predict the time since death. And they have like really standard schedules. So basically, as long as he was tested, um, as long as this was, not the second he died as long as this was like within two hours later he couldn't mm. have, have been very low on potassium you know no. yeah, because yeah. it goes up quite steadily and then it stays around this number exactly yeah, death. Yeah. yeah yeah no it's it's, it's very hard, wanna... hard to pinpoint uh what actually caused him uh yeah. what actually killed him yeah you guys want to do my blood work sure yeah. chance okay yeah. so a lot of I haven't done a video on it because I wanted, well, I just got back into posting, but I also thought it would be good to get your guys' insight on, uh, I did a pretty elaborate panel through Merrick Health when I was in Vegas. Now, some of the context on it was 